All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let's get our Bible ready this morning. Let's learn the Word of God together. I'm excited to be able to, every time we get together and able to study the Word of God, it should be, uh, it should be viewed as something that is uh, precious and it is not something to be taken for granted. Amen. We know that some, in some other part of the world, people are losing their life, you losing their privilege, losing their uh, things that are dear to them because they, they are, um, as, as they are gathering together, seeking to worship the Lord, they don't have the freedom that we have. And every time we are able to get together like this and worship the Lord, we must never forget the blessings of this freedom that God has given to us. All right, let's get our Bible ready this morning together. I was uh, getting ready actually to um, uh, share. I, I was led to, I thought I was going to continue on the subject that we have been talking about Joshua, about the courage, uh, the strength and courage, and also the posture of his heart. I was actually focusing on um, the miracle that is the taking of Jericho. But then again, uh, something interrupted my line of um, thinking, uh, my process. So yesterday, as I was, as I was um, having lunch with my family, I glance on my phone and I, I see uh, the news of what is a horrific news of a deadly uh, celebration that took place in Korea. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, you know, last... Uh, yesterday, it, I, the last, the last uh, data that I see was 151 dead because of a Halloween celebration in Seoul, Korea. And it's, it's something that really caught not just my eyes, but it, it caught my heart uh, instantly, you know. Um, and being that we are not just physical or emotional, but we're also spiritual being, we must always be attentive to what the Spirit is trying to tell us. So um, I, uh, something that I cannot put down in my heart, and it really flashed into my mind, and immediately, you know, something like a word was flashed into my mind, in my spirit. And I know very well because I recognize how many times when God began to speak, you know, He would speak in a very familiar way, and sometimes unexpected, but most of the time, uh, you know when he's speaking to you, and you better listen. So this verse is what I want to share with you this morning, and I want to bring it into our attention so that we will, as a church, be equipped and know that um, we, we ought to walk uh, with the conviction of the Word and the truth of the Holy Spirit as is found in the Word of God, all right? So together, let's open the Bible in the book of Romans, chapter 12, uh, and I want to that I, for the lack of a better word, maybe, I'm, I'm just using the title from the passage as the, as the title for my, for my message. And it is, uh, um, place your life before God. Place your life before God. All right? So let's begin by opening Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. I'm going to be reading from the ESV version. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern. What is the will of God? What is the good and acceptable and perfect? The good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So first one says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect, uh, and perfect will of God, all right? So, well, in case you were thinking, oh, maybe pastor is going to speak about, you know, 
against the celebration and condemning what's going on. Maybe pastor's going to join the bandwagon of people who have been saying, See, I told you it's evil. Well, I want you to know that's not what I'm about to do. Um, I want you to know that uh, my heart grief at, at the thought of 151 souls died senselessly and needlessly. And I don't believe that it's our job as a Christian or as a church to deliver judgment or to present ourselves as the judge. You know, uh, I think we only have one mandate, and that is to, have, to be compassionate. You know, to be compassionate of the broken world, even the most defiant of the grace of God. It is not in our place. You know, I know we've had our share as a church and believer to cast judgment and to speak harshly on people who are so stubborn and so persevere in, in, in the defiance and rebellion against God. But you and I need to understand that we're not God, we're not the Holy Spirit. If people are going to change, it's not because of us, but it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit that works within them and through them. Maybe through our word, maybe through our saying, but it is never because of us. It is never, it is never our place to cast a judgment. Uh, but we are to position ourselves in line of the heart of God. We are commanded to be Christ-like. We are commanded and urged to grow into Christ-likeness. And I can't help but to think that if Christ were here, he, he would be weeping. Because he was the shepherd that says, I am the shepherd that leave the 99 just to find the one that's lost. You know, uh, and, and, and even in the Old Testament, he has been very clear and says that I desire not for the wicked to perish, but for them to, to be turned back, to, to be turned around, to, to receive eternal life. So... You know, seeing something like that really should grieve us and should grieve our church. But I felt that um, as, as I was looking at that, the Holy Spirit began to remind me about what we as a church, how we as a believer sh uh, should stand in the midst of this uh, progressive culture. How are we to act? You know, so that's what I want to share with you this morning. I mean, it's something that is every year come, up, come around. You know, uh, Hollywood, Halloween being dubbed as the second uh, biggest ho uh, holiday, maybe, uh, commercially and also uh, culturally. But how are we as a believer to, to, to take a stand? How are we as a Christian to, to, to act? All right. So I want to read to you another version translation from Romans chapter 12, which is from the message translation. And actually, this is the verse that, that was flashed continuously on my mind. As I read the news. So let's read this together. If you can follow Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. And this is what the message translation says. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. So I get asked this question a lot. So, Pastor, what should we do? You know, so I found that throughout my journey as a pastor, there's always these two extremes. On one extreme, people are acting like their own master, and they say, leave me alone. Let me do what I want, all right? Don't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to do. And then on the other side, there are people who, I don't know, for the lack of a better term, they tend to switch off their brain. And, you know, there are, in fact, there are many of us who, upon entering that door, we, you know, usually when we go to, <laughs> to, to a function room, when we go with our coat, we leave the coat by the door. But instead, you know, we leave our brain at the door. Okay, just tell me what to do. All right. I believe that God desires not to raise a people that are both. That are defiant, rebellious, stand alone, you know, cannot be touched, not accountable. And he also don't want to raise a, a people that are not capable of thinking on their own, of, of being mature in their thinking. I believe God would want us to be in the center. And I believe in the word of Romans chapter 12, he wants a church that are mature and discerning. When I say mature, it means able to make a decision, an even tough decision. No, very well. 
they have their parameters, their values in line, and they are informed to make a decision. Not just informed because of the moral and the, 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 the virtues of the world, but informed because they know the will of God, they know the word of God, and they have discerned the season or the time that they are in, and so ready to make a decision. So this is what I believe God would want us. I want to share with you more than just, you know, a ready food. Oh, this is what you should do. I believe I should not tell you what you should do, but I can point you to the right way of thinking so that you can arrive to a conclusion, not just on this matter alone, but on so many other matters. Because we're living in such a messed up world. We're living in such a progressive culture. So chances are you'll be presented this so many times in your life. You'll be forced to make a decision on the spot. And when that time happens, what are we as a Christian to do? How are we as a follower of Christ? Where are we to stand? Are we going to be on the left or on the right? You know, these polarities can be more drastic. But I believe that, you know, we are not advocating left culture or right culture. We as a believer, we are to advocate biblical culture. Biblical culture. You may not like what I said, but if you are here and you think that you believe in the Bible or trying to believe in the Bible and you think you are a Christian, maybe your ID card says it, then you have got to be going down to the Bible, to the roots of it, to the biblical understanding. If not, you know, I mean, it will be uh, uh, strange for you to go into a bakery only to find out that actually they're selling sandals. Something is wrong. Either you are wrong or their sign is wrong. You know, uh, um, I, I remember of a story of a man who's uh, 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 gravely wounded, and he was trying to find the nearest hospital, or, uh, uh, but he couldn't find it. And then from a distance, he saw a sign, you know, uh, Albert uh, Schweitzer, MD, doctor. So he ran and he knocked the door. He knocked the door and he says, you know, I, I, I need help. I am gravely injured. I need a doctor. And then the man who opened the door says, oh, you know what? That's an old sign. I no longer practice medicine. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and then the man says, you know what? It's up to you what you want to do with your life. But by, 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 you know, by what's decent, you know, take that sign off if you are not who you said you are right there. As a Christian, we don't earn the right to say we are Christian or follower of God if we don't know anything about this word. You know, there's no such a thing as inherited uh, uh, faith. You know, oh, I'm a Christian because my parents are Christians. I want to challenge you. You can begin like that. You can begin to be raised in a Christian household, but you must mature out. You must, you know. So Romans, Paul um, exhorted the church in Roman by saying, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. And I like this uh, word from Dr. Eugene Patterson, the message paraphrase, that says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Sometimes, you know, we don't want to think. You know, and, and, and if, if, if you grow up with that understanding, you know, and, and this generation, they have books for everything. They have books on how to raise kids. They have books on how to grow tomatoes. They have books on how to invest. Books on everything, self-help, you know. But what is sad is that this generation of believers, you know, they didn't realize that they have the ultimate book, but don't bother to read it. Don't bother to want to be challenged to think. Because maybe all their brain cells have been wasted on so many other books that when it comes to the Word of God, they don't want to think. They say, oh, just, just tell me what to do. And even if you are told what to do, you might not like it because you don't grow into that belief. You don't grow it. You have to grow into the faith so that you'll be able to sustain it. The Bible says, uh, in this uh, passage, Eugene Patterson says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. So in other translation, this is what says conformity. So many people become conforming when they become so comfortable with whatever is being presented upon them that it becomes second nature to them. There's no distinction whatsoever. There's no reluctance whatsoever. Oh, this is, this is what's available? Okay. Whatever. 
Anything goes. You know, and it's bad enough that it happens in the world, but it's even worse when it happens in the church. It's worse when it's happened uh, to believers. We become so well adjusted to our culture without even thinking. We refuse to, to, to use our critical logic. I mean, we can be critical to so many other things, but when it comes to the culture of the world, many times we're not critical. Many times when we listen to the word of God, we're very critical. You know, I mean, uh, so many times people wait to speak to me about the sermon and, you know, to just challenge the thoughts and the ideas and be, just become critical in general of the word that was being preached. Or maybe not me, but something that you read or something that you heard. You know, it's, it's, it's easy. It's, 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 it's like as if it's open season to the word of God, to the truth, you know, just it's like hunting season begins, you know. People just want to take a shot at it. But when it comes to the culture of the world, look at TikTok. Look at, you know, all the many challenges in the world. People would just, ah, bucket challenge. Oh, you know, not even thinking. Not even thinking. You just want to be part of it. You know, I, I, I mentioned this to the church a long time ago when, when it was that time. It's not that I'm against that. But what worries me, because I'm a pastor, I'm a student of culture, I learn habits. I want to go deeper and remember, I share this to you. We don't just observe the tip of the iceberg. We're interested in looking what's underneath. So what's underneath, what concerns me, is that tendency to become so well adjusted without even thinking. That it becomes so... Easy for the church to be driven here and there instead of making a difference. We become part of the norm. And not all norms are good. Especially those that are directly against the biblical norm. You know, so we, we become so comfortable. The Bible reminds us this world is not our home. Don't pack your bag there. You know, so how are we to do? What are we to do as a believer? Do not conform. Conformity is when we fit into the culture without even thinking. We, we, we conform to the norm. Never mind what the Bible says. Never mind what you have read. Never mind how you were raised at home. Hopefully it's a Christian home. But you know what? You become so gullible to what's out there. You swallow it outright. So Paul says, don't be conformed, but instead be transformed. Be transformed. And in the message, it says that instead, fix your attention on God. And you be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. So, Transformation begins when you fix your attention, when you fix your attention on God, when you fix your thoughts on Him, when, when, you, when you begin to align yourself with His thought. How do I know His thought, Pastor? Well, there is a written word of God, which is a written thought of God, the mind of Christ. You can begin by reading the word of God. That's why I have said this from this pulpit so many times, and I will never stop. For as long as I'm the pastor, for as long as I'm alive, I will say this again and again and again. You need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. John says, the, the Gospel of John says that you will know the, come on, help me, truth. And what will that truth do to you? It will set you free. Without the truth, there's no freedom in your life. You know, unfortunately, we are more interested to read so many other things in life than to read the one that gives us freedom. Unfortunately, we are more interested, we are critical on so many other things, but we do not want to engage our thought on the Word of God. You're all our bright people. If you're not bright, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be in this city. You wouldn't be going to the school that you're going, doing the work that you're doing right now. But why is it that when it comes to the Word of God, it's as if there is the knowledge, and then there's God. There's the knowledge of the world, and then there's the knowledge of God. You view this as something that is inferior, lower. But you did not 
remember when the word of God that the beginning of knowledge is fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is fear of God. We got to go back to the word of God. And how are we as a follower of Christ to live in this modern society, modern progressive culture? Paul would encourage Roman, which is very identical maybe to the world now at that time, with very progressive city, very progressive culture. Fix your thoughts on God. Fix your thought on God. And don't be so gullible into fitting on the cultural expression without even thinking, without even discerning. The Bible says be discerning so that you will know. By testing, you may discern. In the ESV translation, verse two, uh, the second part of verse 2, there's that phrase says, that by testing you may discern. That by testing you may discern. It's amazing that those six words in English is actually just one word in Greek. Dokimatsu. Uh, it, I know it sounds like Japanese. Dokimatsu. Nee. <laughs> but it's Greek, actually. <laughs> it's very Greek. Dokimatsu. Oh, I know you, all of you are hungry now. <laughs> that by testing you may discern. One word, dokimatsu. What does that word mean, dokimatsu? Dokimatsu simply means the, it carries out the idea that finding the word of something by using it or testing it in the real world. Finding the word of something, the real truth about something by using it or testing it in the real world. All right? So this is, this is something that is interesting. And, and the truth is that this is unacceptable for most Christians in this world. This is unacceptable for most of us. Because usually we want to be shown the will of God first. And then we will do it. And then we'll decide whether we want to do it or not. But this word is teaching us that, you know, the more you walk out in the will of God, the more of his will will be revealed. The more you walk in the, wall, in the will of God, the more your path will be clearer. You see, sometimes maybe you would get a word that you don't understand or you don't necessarily agree at first. But in the humility and the faith that God knows more than you, if you should be submissive and, you know, to... Just do this first, and then it will all become, it will be, it will make more sense in your life. You will start to begin to see what God is trying to say to you that you could not comprehend then when you first listened to the word of God. That by testing you may discern. You must test everything, the Bible says, and hold on to what is good. You cannot, don't, don't be so gullible that you fit into everything the world is offering you. I don't care if it's professor, doctor, or so many studies, so many uh, experiments. You know, it's been written in a journal, something. But if it goes against the norm, it goes against the principle of the word of God. Don't fit into it without even thinking. You have to discern and put into the same filter the word of God on everything that you see and hear. So that's why I don't want to be too quick at saying, okay, don't do this and don't do that. In the past, I'm guilty of that. And as a parent, I'm guilty of that many times. But I'm, I want to grow more even as a parent, as a pastor, as a leader. I don't want to fall into legalism and judgmentalism. But instead, we should go back to the word of God. And before we are so quick at saying that's wrong and judging, we should go back to the word of God and discern. And if the word of God says something that is so clear, you know, I know sometimes there are some things that are not clear, but sometimes it is not clear because we are yet to the time where the fullness of the meaning is. And sometimes to reach to where the fullness of the meaning is, you got to walk with it first. You got to walk with it first. So dokimatsu is finding the word of something by using or testing it in the real world. And this is not popular for most Christians, for most of us, unacceptable. We want to be shown the will of God first, and then we'll decide. We'll judge. Uh, tell me what God wants me to do, and I'll judge whether or not it'll fit into my schedule or my understanding. I'll judge whether or not it's valid or legitimate things to do. 
you know. We want to know God's will ahead of time and then figure out whether or not we're going to do it. Many times before you know fully his will, you must first follow his will. You must first do. We want to know God's will ahead of time, but it's not that revelation that many times he will give. It is the obedience that must first come. You can say, how can I know the will of God unless he reveals it to me? Well, you know what? There are plenty of revealed will of God. Will of God that is already plain out, spelled out. It's already revealed. You can start with that. You can start with, you know, do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Don't murder. You know, be honest. Be honorable. Things like that. You can start with that. There's plenty of revealed will in God's word to start with for you and I to begin to walk to. The more you walk down the road of God's revealed will... That's right there in the scripture. The clearer you will see the road ahead. The clearer you will see the road ahead. And this is actually natural. You know, we grow up like this. We just didn't realize it. When you were little, most of your parents will tell you before you go to sleep, brush your teeth. And then, you know, being that you're five years old or seven years old, you maybe are reluctant. You fight your way out of it. But your parents would, any good parents would instill a discipline. And at that time, it first becomes a habit. It first becomes a habit without understanding to the kids. They don't understand why. Why? But they know if they don't do it, they'll be in trouble. They first walk in it. They first try it out. And then they realize that, oh, you know what? My teeth are clean. And when they comprehend and grow, they're able to think, more and critically, they realize that, oh, you know what? The discipline that I was doing mindlessly actually has a purpose. And now that they are older, they know the purpose. It's for my health. It's for my betterment. It's for my benefit. You see, many times it takes obedience first. We must find the word of something by using it, by testing it in the real world. That's obedience, that's submission, that's humility. We test it that we may discern. We walk in it first and we will discern. So sometimes God will tell you not to do something, but this goes against the, the, the norm in the world. Why? You know, we grew up with that one magical word ever since we were small. Why? You know, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but God is the only one who deserves the, 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 the right to say why not. Because he's God. You know, you may not get the answer of that question, why? Because he wants you to obey. He wants you to walk in obedience. He wants you to test that you may discern. Find the word of something by using it, testing it in the real world. You might not always get, get it right the first time. You may not always understand it immediately. But God would want you to walk into obedience. So that's the foundation thought. Don't conform, but be transformed. Fix your eyes on God. You know, I, I came across a simple guidelines from a pastor, a pastor in Arizona, Pastor Mark Driscoll. Three simple guidelines when it comes to um, uh, navigating ourselves in the culture. It's simple, three R. Receive, redeem, or reject. Now, I want to challenge you to grow through it and navigate yourself through this filter, you know, because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to spell it out for you because if I do that, you're not going to grow. You're not going to be thinking. You're not going to engage in your discernment. But I want to challenge you. So there are, there are things in our culture, in our life, that is smack dab in line with the Word of God. Then we can receive it. No alteration needed. We can receive it. But then again, there are things that may not necessarily be in line, but it can be redeemed. Then if we see that this can serve the better purpose of God, we can redeem it. But don't ever forget, the major point of redemption is solideo gloria, to the glory of God. 
not to your own enjoyment. Hello? Uh, well, actually, there are so many things that are redeemed. You know, uh, uh, um, something that may, may not be good to begin with, but then again, it, it, it can be redeemed. Anybody here driving a Volkswagen? Anyone? No? Maybe someday? <laughs> well, you know, uh, when it began, Volkswagen is the brainchild of uh, Adolf Hitler, a Nazi. But then again, you know, well, it's a mechanical. There's no evil in it. <laughs> it was redeemed to become a good car. I don't know if it's good or not. I think it's good. You know, Anybody here celebrate birthday? <laughs> Do you know that there's no celebration of birthday in the Bible. Only one in the Old Testament of Pharaoh and one in the New Testament of Herod. <laughs> you know that, that culture of lighting a candle, blowing it off, and then making a wish? That's actually pagan. That's actually pagan. Make your wish, blow it out in the candle, and the spirit will give it a, ooh, what did I just commit here? <laughs> what did we just do in the church every time we blow a candle? Make a wish, make a wish. It's serious now. Uh, some of you are judgmental. Say, oh, pastor, that's not spiritual. Uh, well, you and me both. I mean, but why is it safe for us to do that? Because we redeem it. I hope you are the same with me. That when you make a wish, you're not making a wish to spirit. <laughs> spirit come. Because <laughs> we have one spirit that we adore. It's the Holy Spirit. We know, Lord, thank you for one more year in my life. Oh, yes, I do that every time. I'm waiting to blow a candle. I hope you guys are preparing a candle after this. I want to blow and make my wish. But I am making my wish, not to any spirit. I'm making my wish to God. I'm making my wish to the one who says, ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Hello? And I know that my wish is not for me, for my enjoyment. I wish to be healthy so that I can serve the will of God. That's the underlying of redemption. It's for the glory of God, not for just your enjoyment. Hello? Do you know that Christmas to begin with, anybody celebrate Christmas here? Uh, we wouldn't be a church if we don't celebrate Christmas. Do you know that Christmas to begin with was not a Christian celebration? It was a pagan celebration. You look in the history. To a certain year, it was uh, forbidden to... Celebrate Christmas in Massachusetts. Are we talking about the same Massachusetts pastor? Yes. Because it used to be a celebration of some God. But then again, the early father who redeemed it and make it all about Christ. Jesus was not born on December 25th. I hope you know that. Please, please tell me you know that. If you don't, we're in a big, big trouble here. Anybody celebrate Easter? Do you know what the word Easter means? That's why many times we say the Resurrection Sunday is not Easter. Where in the gospel did it say about anything about bunny? Especially bunny that lays egg. Not even in National Geographic there's a bunny that lays egg. It hasn't been found yet. It hasn't been discovered. It is as pagan as pagan was. But the early father, you know, of the church you know, see, you know, to direct the attention and, and redeem it to be the resurrection of Christ. You know, do we still bake egg? Yeah, we're guilty of that. I know some church in New Hampshire that dropped like thousands of egg from helicopter for kids. But, you know, they want the kids to come to church and listen to the good news of Christ. We can redeem it, but remember what I said in the beginning. The major, major, major purpose, aim of redemption is solid day of glory, the glory to God. Hello? Can we redeem Halloween, Pastor? Come on, exercise your thinking. You know, I, I think if, if, if you have your heart right, you can, but should you do it? I don't know. I'm not going to answer it for you. I want you to mature in your understanding. Hello? But I can tell you this. In my family, 
I have standards. In this church, I have standards for people who stand here. You know, and you're free whether you want to follow it or not. But if, if you decide to be here, then, you know, there's this green light, yellow light, red light. Anybody seen this in the road before? Green light, it means anything goes. I mean, there's nothing specific. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a sin. It's aligned with the word of God or it's good. Yellow light, it means, you know, it can be right. It can be wrong depending on whether you see it. If you belong to a certain part of group that doesn't believe in that and you're doing that, then it's wrong. It's wrong. I mean, my kids don't get to choose where they want to be born. <laughs> God, in his sovereign will, has placed them under my care, my bosom, and I'm responsible to raise them in the best I know how. And the best I know how is from the word of God. I don't teach this to their kids or your kids. But if, as a pastor, I get a revelation, I share it to you guys. But it is not something that, you know, is constrictive, but, you know, to encourage you. Think about it. Think about it. We won't be a church in the world. We won't be a city that is set on a hill if everything somebody else has to think for you. You need to think for yourself in line with what is in the word of God. And then the last is reject. If it's so directly against the word of God, you know, there's, there can never be Christian killing or, or you know, oh, oh, let's let's do Christian murder. I mean, I mean, just redeem it for God, you know, or or you know, all kinds of evil, and then redeem it. Oh, I'm doing this for God. Let me slap your cheek for God. Let's try that. Let's see whether God is glorified at your expense. I know there are people that even after this guideline has been given can debate left and right, top to bottom, front and back, and make a fool out of me. I know. Because I am believing there are more people that are brighter than me in this room. You know, and that's okay. It's not the brightness of man that is being put in charge here. But it is the brightness of Christ. So, but let me close with this word so that it will balance. Should we participate or not, Pastor? What do you think? I mean, of course, uh, even um, the early church father, or at least the Western church, they did try to naturalize Halloween. November, there's like an All Saints Day or something. You know, people... Dressing up as saints, you know, if that works, there are churches doing Halloween party, dress up like a biblical character. Praise God. If you want to do that, that's fine. But any of you want to come Halloween party dressing like Moses? <laughs> or donkey, maybe? <laughs> no condemnation, no condemnation. It's not because I just check all your Instagram and say, okay, huh, okay. No, no condemnation. Feel free. I will not condemn you on that. There is no condemnation in Christ. Be blessed. But the Bible says if you do something and you're not sure, anything you do without faith is a sin. So you better be sure when you do it <laughs> that it is bringing the glory to God. All right? So I will not, I will not, I will not. But let me close with this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Let me tell you, the goal for us is Christ-likeness. Everybody say Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. Not churchy, churchiness. No, Christ-likeness. All right? Matthew 5, 13, 16. Come on, if you have it, I'm reading from ESV. I'm going to wait a while so that maybe you can find it and we can read together and we can declare it together. Matthew 5, 13, 16. Right? Matthew 5, 13, 16, ESV version. This is what the Word of God says. Actually, Jesus is the one saying it. All right? You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? 
It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, as best as we can try to be in this world, let me tell you something. There will always be distinctive quality about us that cannot be put into obscurity. If you choose to live for God as best as we can try to fit in this world, by nature you should know you are salt. By nature you should know you are light. And the word of warning for us is if salt has lost its taste. And you know that to, to cook uh, 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 to cook a bowl of soup, you don't need a bowl of salt. Hello, anybody here cooking? To cook a pan of soup, you don't need a pan of salt. Just a dash, maybe a little. That just to tell you, you know, if you feel you are minority, well, you know, you're salt. What do you expect? I remember watching the Band of Brothers, the, the airborne paratrooper, they say, one of the soldiers, before being dropped behind enemy lines, says to the commander, Sir, we are surrounded. And then the commander says, We're paratrooper. What do you expect? <laughs> we are to be surrounded. Because we are to be dropped behind enemy line. We are to be surrounded. You are salt. What do you expect? But that little salt, that dash of salt, can make a change. Can make a difference. You see? Now, the, the warning is, if salt has lost its taste, if you lose your distinctive quality that makes you Christ-like or Christian, it says here, no longer good for anything to be thrown out or trampled under people's feet. This is why the world has seen the church as irrelevant. Just close the church. Vote on a law that is totally against the church because the church has no use. Whether they're there or not, there's no difference. Just become something that is trampled by the foot. It's always a, you know, victim instead of becoming a victor. Yeah, we can, we can be in the world. We can, we can do culture. We can. But we should decide to do culture not at the expense of our godly and distinctive quality. I would not put out my light just so I can be in the world and with the world, even if I thought I'm preaching the gospel. If ever, my light needs to shine brightly, brighter in the darkness, because that's what makes me who I am. The flavor of the kingdom of God should be even tastier. I cannot lose my saltiness. No one light up a lamp just to hit it under the table. But a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Church, this is our call as a church. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. If you are so comfortable, so at home, and slip by smoothly at every culture that the world is shoving at you without ever thinking anything, something doesn't kick back right here. I am here to tell you something must be wrong. Something died already. Something died because the Holy Spirit should be the motor that, 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 that drive your passion. He should be the filter. The word of God should be able to give you at moment's notice. You know why people got sick? You know why sometimes we have fever? It's because our body has what's called immune system, and, and they detect foreign particle, infection. And when that happens, our body temperature rises. Alarm. Ding, 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 ding. Foreign particle here. We were created physically with that system. Why can't we have that spiritually? 
God has given us His Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Helper. But for the longest time, we have shut Him off, put it on the closet somewhere in the back seat and choose to drive the car our own. No wonder we sleep so comfortably with the culture without even thinking. We accept everything. We chew everything. We eat everything, even one that we know is going to cause death to us. So I want to encourage you. At the same time, I want to warn you. We are the salt. We are the light. Yeah, I mean, you can have innocent celebration. But remember who you are. Put yourself in a way that gives light to people. You know, is it okay, Pastor? What should I do? Should I or should I not? I don't know. What? <laughs> that by testing you may discern. Test it out. Discern. Have a discernment. Exercise your discernment. But I would not want to encourage you to violate your conscience if you know the Holy Spirit is in you, if you know you are Christ then don't resist the conscience within the heart, within your heart. Amen, church? So I hope this will, Pastor, you didn't clarify it. You make it even more confusing. Well, good. I want you to think. Good. Not all word seeks to bring comfort. Some seeks to trouble you so that you grow. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. Your body is God's. Your spirit is God's. Glorify Him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We're so grateful. This morning, help us to place our life before you. To present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Just like what Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Help us of that. Even though many times we don't know what is your will? We don't know the big picture, but we know the steps we are to take. Help us, O oh God, that by testing we may discern. Help us to put ourselves at the back seat when it comes to your will. That the supremacy of your will will lead. Help us not to be the driver of this car. But help us to yield to you. Help us, O oh Lord. To be able to test by discerning so that we will be able to know whether we are to receive, to redeem, or to reject. I pray, Lord, that the alarm be switched on to every single person right now. That that early warning system that is found in the Holy Spirit be reactivated in our life that guides us, help us to understand your word, to understand your will. Should we do it or should we not do it? Is it okay or is it not okay? Help us to grow in the search of knowing the answer, that our discernment will grow and that we become a thinking Christian, that we become a mindful Christian, that in this process, we become number one, honoring. We honor you. And number two, honorable. We honor the dignity of God within our life. And then number three, be mindful so that we do not become a stumble for other people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray and I declare that conviction from your word will once again become like a wave, oh God, swiping, oh God, this church, filling this church, oh God, that faith will arise. And hope will thrive. Faith in your word. And hope in your promises. Even though we don't know, oh God, 
we don't see clearly, but that we will begin to walk humbly and obediently in your will, O oh God, in what we know, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, move this mountain of intimidation, this mountain of fear, insecurity, this mountain of taunting and humiliation that the world is launching at us. But instead, oh God, let our feet be planted so deep and so strong in your word that we will become immovable, oh God. Help us never to lose our distinctive quality, our saltiness and the brightness of your light within us that's going to shine through us. Help us, oh God, to persevere, to contend. Because we know, oh God, that the church should be the morality, should be the light, the conscience of the nations. Help us, oh God, that we may know the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.